Well, it is sure great to be here with you uh, this morning. As I've already said, I say it more than once because I want you to be reassured. I'm not trying to convince myself. Um, I am glad to be with you here this morning. And there's, there's a couple reasons why I'm glad to be here with you this morning. And it's not just because it's finally March, okay? And finally March means there's one less month of winter to worry about. And for me, that's a big deal. But that's not, that's not even one of the reasons why I'm glad to be here with you this morning. I'm not just glad to be here because we're starting a new series that I believe is going to accomplish some things in our lives if we're open to that. Um, That's not the only reason I'm excited to be here this morning. Um, I am excited and grateful for both of those things, but uh, I will be honest, and this sounds a little cheesy, but you're going to have to bear with me because it ties into what we're talking about today, but I am excited every single week to be amongst family, right? I consider you to be part of my family. And, and to me, that's an encouragement. I love coming to church and seeing so many smiling faces and being able to connect with people that maybe it's only been a week since I've seen you, maybe it's been longer. I enjoy that. I'm excited about that. We're not just friends, but we're family. Now, you might call it a church family um, or whatever you want, but there is a family element to the body of Christ. Wouldn't you agree? There should be. I believe that's what we see in Scripture that Christ, that God uh, intended for us. Now, there's a lot of good things that take place, not only in a church family, but in a natural family. There's a lot of good things. There's a little dysfunction at times, and that's perhaps normal. You know, you might be looking at an individual. Don't do that. Um, But it's not perfect, but there's a lot of really good things that go on. Now, maybe you don't feel yet that you have a church family, and I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to say that we would love for you to be part of our church family. We value you, and we would love for you to be a part of that, but what we're getting to is that we are created to do life together, right? We are created as human beings to experience life alongside one another. Now, we're, we're getting into this series um, for this month talking about relationships, and I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a little scared of that because, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not very old. Um, you know, I, I'm, I, I've been married for five years, which is awesome, but I'm not necessarily, you know, I don't feel like I can impart wisdom on that. Um, so I feel kind of grateful that I can start this, this sermon series off because I can kind of, you know, set the trajectory a little bit, um, and, uh, and I'm excited for what God's going to do in this, but I feel like I need to make a blanket statement, not only for myself, for the church, but for us as people, before we begin this sermon series, I need to make a statement to cover us throughout this entire month, um, because we are talking about relationships, I want you to know one thing, we are not perfect. I am not perfect, no one in this room is perfect, and so there's going to be things in our lives, there's going to be relationships in our lives that are going to be a little complicated. There's going to be some issues that come up in them. I may not have all the answers, not one person outside of God himself has all the answers, but thankfully he gave us a, you know, a book that we can reference as it pertains to some of these things in our lives. That's called the Bible, in case you weren't tracking with me. Um, But, with that being the case, we can assume that there is only one uh, one relationship that we can have as humans that has any element of perfection at all, and that's our relationship with God. And just to let you know, we're not the part that's perfect, right? That's the only relationship that we as people can have that has any element of perfection in it, and it is because God is perfect. And we're starting this series called Fixer Upper this morning, Uh, and if your house is anything like ours, okay, uh, there is at the very least a standing DVR recording on Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. for HGTV, okay? Anyone else? No? Th- just a, Okay, we got a couple. All right. And it is for this show called Fixer Upper. It's a, it's a show on HGTV, and it's, uh, the new ones are on Tuesday evenings. And uh, my wife loves it. My mom loves it. I'm not opposed to it. Um, <laughs> 
it's the easiest way to confess I enjoy it without actually saying that. I am convinced of one thing. I tell, I joke with my wife frequently. I, I say, I think Chip and I would be fast friends, okay? He would probably make me feel a little uncomfortable because he goes out of his comfort zone a little more. But uh, this show focuses around this couple, Chip and Joanna Gaines, and they live in Waco, Texas. And um, it's really been something that's kind of caught on. The premise is simple. Uh, they have, they have a, you know, a realtor licensed real estate company that they, that they do work with, and then Chip owns a construction company. And so the premise of this show and of what they do is simple. Rather than purchasing a new home with their client's budget, they convince them uh, to sign on for a fixer-upper, okay? They convince them to sign on for a, a fixer-upper. It's always ugly, it's always run down, and it's usually a little bit gross, okay? That is the qualifications for a fixer-upper in this show. Then what they do is they take their total budget, rather than putting it in, into buying a new house, they put more money into the renovation of it than they do into purchasing it, usually, and that's the concept of the show. It's all about reclaiming the house to be what it once was. Now, this show has capitalized on the restoration and revitalization trend that has gone through networks like HGTV and the DIY network over the past few years. You've probably seen more than you can keep track of. And then the spin-offs have spin-offs, and it just it's this big, it's this big trend that's been going on. But it's all about taking something that's run down, beat up, and overlooked and making it into something new, something beautiful and valuable once again. Which leads us to the series that we're beginning today, and this series is all about relationships. And throughout this, the month, as we've said a few times this morning, we're going to be looking at some, some relationships and certain areas of relationships that might require a little bit more work. Now, some of you might be thinking, you might try to, I, I like to say this, you, you might be getting ahead of me, and you might be thinking, you know what, Pastor Ben, I showed up this morning with a fixer-upper, Okay. I, I thought there'd be more of a laugh, unless, <laughs> unless both sides are thinking it, and it, okay? Um, but it is true. We all have work to do on our lives, in our lives, in our relationships, and uh, that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about this concept, uh, and so I'm going to ask you to be open-minded with me as we, because as we look at relationships, we have to remember that relationships are a two-way street, right? There's two people in a relationship, and, and I might, this might, you might not like this, but if there's a relationship that is a little broken or has some dysfunction in it, uh, we tend to, to usually think that we are free from blame, but I'd like to remind us this morning that it is a two-way street, and it is complicated. We are people that are not perfect, and relationships can get messy, so throughout this series, each week, uh, and this is maybe a part that you have to just take notice of, each week will be titled based off of another fixer-upper type show, okay? So I talked about some of the spin-offs. We're going to be looking at a few of those throughout this month. And this morning's message is entitled Rehab Addict. And Rehab Addict um, is an interesting show, and I'll just give you a little history about it. Rehab Addict follows a woman by the name of Nicole Curtis, and she is a huge advocate for the preservation and restoration of homes and architecture, specifically that were made before World War II. That's the thing that she loves. She sees things in them that not everyone else sees. And so she, she's all about preserving those types of homes and places. Now, this show has become one of our personal favorites um, because of some of the places that it takes place. She grew up in Detroit, so she has a number of houses that she's uh, renovated in the city of Detroit, including her grandfather's, which was kind of cool. But another uh, place where she currently lived or have lived in the past is Minneapolis St. Paul. And uh, I lived in Minneapolis. My wife lived in Minneapolis before we were dating. My parents lived in Minneapolis. So you're watching this show and you're seeing places that you've gone before. And it's just an interesting connection to see what she's doing through this show. Now, her model is pretty simple, and yet I believe it's pretty effective, and it's something that I want us to apply to this series. Her goal is to restore these old homes to their old glory rather than modernize them. 
She wants to bring out the elements that were there from the beginning rather than add something new that's going to cover something up. Her, one of her favorite things she does is she rips up floors because she wants to find hardwood floors, and she also loves to find brick in houses, things that people have covered up over the years. She wants to bring out because they add character to what she's doing, uh, what she's doing in them. So this morning, we're, as we're focusing on relationships, it makes me wonder if there are relationships in our lives that are no longer what they once were. And I'd be willing to bet that most of us can think of a person or a relationship that over time, it has changed. Maybe at one point in time, it was really valuable, it was really important, it was really strong, but over time, things have changed. Over the years, things can change just like people do. And relationships that were once strong, vibrant, and God-honoring may look different than they once did. They may have gotten overlooked by busyness, pushed aside from indifference, or torn apart by unforgiveness. And those are hard to look at, because they're not pretty. There's a little uncomfortability that that comes into play with them. But those are some of the relationships that we're going to be looking at throughout this month. And if we were to learn one thing from the fixer-uppers and rehab addicts of the world, we would realize that some of those relationships were once so, that were once so vital and full of life simply need a little rehab. They need a little work, uh, and that little work may go a long way um, to bringing them back to what they once were, kind of in the lines that these people do with these homes. And so that's our comparison. So don't get insulted if, I'm, if we're comparing you to a house, you know, Um, Unless somebody calls you this old house, then maybe um, you could be a little irritated with them. But uh, I have two points that I want to talk about here this morning. The first one is kind of, again, as I get into these, sometimes they don't make sense or by themselves they sound kind of silly. But first one is we're drawn to rehab, sort of. We're sort of drawn to things of a rehabilitating nature, okay? We love an underdog story, don't we? Anybody love a good underdog story in here? Um, it's, it's what a lot of these shows are at, are at, at their core. They, they're, they're a true underdog story. And I think that there's something that is set up within us to be drawn out um, when we look at the hidden potential of something. I believe it's something God put in our hearts and in our minds to be attracted to the hidden potential of things like that. I don't know why it made me think of this, but for some reason it made me think of the movie Cool Runnings, um, which if you don't remember, highlighted the the first time that the Jamaicans uh, had a bobsled team in the Olympics in 1988. And and they were the definition of an underdog story. Yet yet from what I was able to recall, because I was born in 1988, People, people gathered around them. They were excited about the underdog story that was this team who came from a, a continent who, to my knowledge, doesn't have snow. They had to borrow equipment to make it happen. They didn't necessarily do as well as they wanted to, but it was an underdog story that people got behind. They were the definition of that underdog story. And see, the interesting thing is people like Nicole from Rehab Addict, people like Um, uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines, they see potential everywhere. Everywhere they go, or at least that's what the show makes it out to be, is that they see potential. They walk into a room, and there's some of you who might be talented this way, they walk into a room, and they can see what it could be. They're not looking at what's in front of them, but they see uh, something in their mind, in their heart, about what it could be. The heart of a rehab addict is one of restoration and reconciliation. That may, in fact, be one of the hardest parts when thinking about addressing relationships in our lives and the value that they could still hold. Oftentimes, we're too prone to focus on a perceived offense or the misunderstanding to see that we may be missing out on a gift from God. Sometimes, I, I'm guilty of it too, sometimes we get, we get focused on what bothered us so much that we're, we're willing to overlook the fact that God might have put that relationship in our lives for a purpose. See, it's no secret, like we talked about, that we are created as relational beings. 
Almost immediately after God created Adam, he knew that something was missing. Genesis 2.18 in the NLT says, when the Lord God, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. I don't believe that this statement was said strictly for the population of the earth because God had just created Adam out of nothing. So if he wanted to populate the earth, he could have just done it. I believe that he did this in part for the relationship perspective. He understood that we as humans needed to be in relationship. We're wired for it, but as imperfect human beings interact with other imperfect humans, there's bound to be some trouble along the way. And it's safe to say that each and every one of us have experienced a relationship like that. A relationship that could use a little rehab, and whether it was by our own hand or not, We've all been there. We've all been part of one of those relationships. Uh, I reference a a, a preacher, a pastor, almost every time I speak, and it's because he's just, he's really engaging, he's fun to listen to, uh, and he has great insights, and his name is Stephen Furtick, and uh, he has a quote about relationship that I think is so, it's so specifically accurate that I actually don't want to read it, but I'm going to. He says, the greatest pain and pleasure you will experience in your life will be in the context of relationship. The greatest pain and pleasure will be in the context of relationship. Think about that for a second. The realm of relationship holds both the greatest pain and the greatest pleasure in our lives. It has both the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. That statement, at least in my, in my heart, rings true. I, I began to think about, you know, I work with students, and, and maybe this doesn't apply to them quite at this point, but maybe more so college age. I, I think of the, the roller coaster of, of relationships when you're in that, the dating age, right? Uh, you know, if you've ever gone through a breakup, all of a sudden it feels like your world is over, you know, and, and maybe you end up getting a little dramatic about it, but then you switch it to the, the high that you have that day that you walk down the aisle with your wife or your husband. Relationships, they can, they can bring you down and they can bring you up. There's a lot that can happen in those things. See, but there's a problem when we look at restoration and reclaiming or when we look at a fixer-upper. The very nature of looking at a fixer-upper means that the house, the item, the person, or the relationship is in a state other than what it was created for, right? If something needs to be reclaimed or fixed up, it means that it's not the way it was once intended to be. And sometimes, over time, Our relationships end up in that place. And this is the bottom line, is that rehab requires brokenness. If we're going to rehab something, if we're going to fix it up, it has to be broken in the first place. Otherwise, it's not going to do us any good to fix it up. And maybe at the end of the day, that's where our attraction to shows like this come in. See, if you're anything like me, you're able to look at your life, a relationship, or situation, and understand that there's a problem. I'm not... I'm not a dummy. I just play one sometimes. Um, But I can look at a situation and understand that there's a problem, okay? I can make that, uh, I can make that assessment. But sometimes uh, I might be aware of the problem, but it's difficult to have the vision of addressing the issues, right? I could walk into a a room that's dilapidated and gross and and understand there's something wrong with this room, but I may not have the vision or the understanding to say, okay, uh, this needs to happen, drywall, electrical, you know, I may not have the comprehension to look at that. So sometimes in our lives, we know a relationship is, 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 it's having issues or something that needs to be done, but we don't see the big picture and how to make it happen. That's one of the things that impresses me so much about the fixer-uppers and the rehab addicts. These people, they work on these homes. They have such an incredible ability to look past the current reality of the home and to see its potential. For a lot of these situations, it's not about building something new, but rather pulling something of value out of what's already there. And at the end of the day, this is kind of where we're getting to this, because this morning I wanted to set us up for the next three weeks. I wanted to set us up to look at some of these relationships that we're going to talk about, because I can't stand up here and answer the question for you unless we took all day every day for a month 
uh, I can't answer for you the relationships in your life that need to be addressed. I can't answer for you at this point in time whether or not that's a relationship that should continue or whether it's detrimental. I can't do that. Only you can do that. So I want to empower you to be able to do that. And I believe that at the end of the day, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we have to come to a conclusion about these relationships in our lives. We need direction on which relationships need, we need to work on rehabbing and rebuilding. And when it comes down to it, some of them might not make the cut. And that's a hard thing when we're looking at this idea because we might be excited about fixing it up and, and rebuilding these things, but at the end of the day, there might be some that don't make it. Romans twelve eighteen says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This puts the ownership on us to do that, but as we talked about, relationships are a two-way street. It says, if it is possible, it uh, implies that there's gonna be times where it might not be possible. And all we are to do is be responsible for ourselves. See, if you look at Fixer Upper, the show, uh, they, they show their clients, usually it's three houses. They take them, they walk them through, they give them what they think would be their vision, and then they're left to choose. They're all unique, and they all need plenty of work, but they all have value. Every single one of them has value. They all have the same goal with each one, but some of them don't work for what they want to accomplish through it. Some contradict the hope and the vision of the clients, while others would take too much money or time or resources or work to get out of it what they hope for. Sometimes they walk into one and they say, this is a great location, there's these aspects that are great, but given your budget, there's only a few things that we can do, and so they're left to decide. They're left to rank on, the, on their levels of importance, what they're able to get out of it, what they're able to put into it. They have to choose. And as we seek God's guidance for the rehab of our relationships, we may uncover that some of those relationships may not be in God's plan to be restored. If every relationship we have in our lives is in desperate need of rehab, we need to be willing to step back and admit that maybe we have some blame in the equation, right? If we look around and every single one of our relationships is in disrepair, is dysfunctional, we have to be able to, wi we have to be willing to admit what the common denominator might be. And I don't like saying that because I don't like thinking about that in my own life, that sometimes I'm the one who's responsible. If a relationship has never once pushed you closer to God and it is always in a state of, of dysfunction or disrepair, there's a chance it might not be the one that God has for you to restore. Now, that doesn't mean that he can't do a miracle in that situation, but that's why we have to be in tune to his Holy Spirit to understand where he's guiding us to in that situation. On the flip side, if you're looking at a relationship that at one time had history, had value, had stability, and a foundation that was God-honoring, there's more to work with has better bones to build up. I've told my students this before, but when I was in college, I had some friendships that I developed through where I worked. And uh, we had plenty of common, which at its basis, that's how you begin a friendship, right? You, you realize you like the same sports team, or you went to the same school, or you're, you work the same job. You have a foundation to connect with somebody. Maybe you go to the same church. It's the basis of a relationship. But while, while the relationships were not inherently bad, over time I began to realize that they were in no way pushing me closer to God. They were in no way challenging me in my walk with God and to grow in that relationship. In fact, there were times where maybe it did the opposite and eventually I began to understand that the relationship was counterproductive to what God wanted to do in my life. And I had to make a choice. It wasn't an easy choice. It wasn't a simple choice. But I had to choose to move on from that relationship. And it wasn't like I told them, hey, w I can't. just can't do this. I, I didn't do that, but I, I had to change certain ways in my life. And if they, would, if they were to call me today, I would gladly pick up the phone. But I had to change the access that I gave them to my life. Because the access that they had, was, it that, that was related to the influence that they had on my life. And at that point in time, I had to protect that. And at the end of the day, our relationship with God has to come 
before any other relationship. It has to come before any other relationship. And we have to be asking God for wisdom as it pertains to those ones that, that maybe are stressing that relationship. Maybe they don't honor God. We have to ask for him to d- guide and direct us in how we should approach dealing with those. And the, the point that I want to conclude on today is that we've been given the ultimate rehab example. There's a few things that we need to remember when we're talking about restoration and rehabilitation. When God created man, he did so in his own likeness. The likeness that he created Adam and Eve in included his moral likeness. When he created them, they were perfect. They were his, his uh, expression of perfection. They were created blameless without sin until they disobeyed God's command. And with that, sin entered the world. And with that, we are all subject to experiencing and dealing with sin in our lives. Since that day when Adam and Eve broke God's command, we've dealt with a sin problem. In the book of Romans, we see that we've all encountered that sin problem in our lives and that the wages of that sin problem is death. We've seen that, we know that, we understand that. See, it makes me think of some of these fixer-upper projects, these rehab attic projects that we see on TV. It's like this, this one uh, specifically that I had found. It's a 1913 Tudor house that Nicole redid on Rehab Attic. And uh, AJ, I think there's about four pictures you can kind of scroll through. Um, it, was, it was garbage, right? Inside, it was gross. It was wore down. It was nasty. But here's the thing. It wasn't always this way, right? This house was not always this way. When it was completed 100 years ago, okay, 1913, 100 years ago, it was perfect. It was finished according to how the architect saw fit. But over time, things were overlooked. Problems weren't addressed, and they began to become bigger and bigger problems. One project was started, but never finished. It was left in a dire state. And I think that's how it is for each and every one of us. God created us with a specific purpose. He created us with a a value of perfection. But due to the sinful nature that we experience, that we see in this world, things have changed. Over time, things have changed. He, he created us innocent and perfect in his sight. Mistakes are made. Progress may start, but doesn't get far enough. And we, too, eventually find ourselves in a dire state. And much like one of the relationships that maybe we've been, excuse me, maybe we've been thinking about this morning, that could use a sprucing up, our relationship with God can look the same way. It can be convicting to look at a picture like that, and I know for me, there's been times in my life where I've, I've been able to identify that there were areas in my life that I needed God to fix up because it felt like one of those pictures. And I began to understand something. I realized that God is in the rehab business. Think about that for a second. God is in the business of rehab. He is. His goal for each and every one of us is that we might be brought back to our intended glory that he created us with, right? He created us with a purpose. He created us in perfection. And through sin, we've fallen away from that. And his desire is to bring us back to what once was. His desire is to bring out those, those qualities, those talents, those giftings that he, he created us with. He wants to bring those out of us, not create something new, because he already created something new. God doesn't look at us, and he doesn't see the baggage. He doesn't see the guilt. He doesn't see the shame or the hurt that we see when we look at ourselves. He doesn't see those things. He doesn't walk up and see a tore down room like in those houses. But instead, like one of these people who works in this all day, every day, he looks at us and he sees potential. He sees our value. He sees the good that he wants to bring out of us. He sees us as a person who needs divine restoration. He doesn't see the lies we've told or the past we're ashamed of 
Instead, he sees a fixer-upper. He takes us from run, a rundown house or a broken being into something beautiful with purpose. And, and it seems kind of, kind of simple, but as I'm thinking about this, I think of the transformation that takes place in these shows. And that's the transformation that God wants to do in each and every one of us. And so, AJ, there's, there's those pictures again with the before and the afters. Just go through them real quickly, because that's what I believe God wants to do in each and every one of us. He looks at our lives, and he doesn't see what's there. He sees what could be. He sees what he planned on their being there in the first place. He believes in our potential so greatly that he sent Jesus to die for that potential. One of my favorite scriptures, Romans 5.10, for if while we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Uh, There was one point in, in our lives that we were actively set against what God wanted to do, yet he still sent his son to die for us. He looks at us like, like Joanna looks at those houses. And she's probably one of the best. She walks into a room and she sees what it could be. Just as we close, Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The transformation was started. But sometimes we can hold it up. Sometimes we can put a stop on on what God wants to do in our lives. And I just wanted to remind us as we began this series looking at relationships that his goal and plan is for our restoration. That's number one. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross was so that you and I could be restored to a right relationship with God. That was the plan. And that restoration has nothing to do with our current state, but everything to do with the potential that he sees in each of us. And I believe, and this is the reason I went this direction this morning, I believe that we first must be restored to Christ if we have any hope of restoration or fixing up any other relationship in our lives. If we're not right with God, if we haven't made that decision to commit our lives to Christ, then we're going to be operating not on all the information that we need. We're going to be making choices without the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're going to be making choices based on things other than what God's word would say. And so I feel like it's necessary to remind us, to encourage us, to give us an opportunity to first restore your relationship with Christ. Maybe you've never began one, and today is the perfect way to start. Maybe there's, there's something that you need to just ask God to deal with in your life in order to make you uh, able to deal with these relationships. Because God has put you in specific places that only you can make a difference in. Those relationships that are broken, you might be the only person to be used in that relationship. But if we're not where God has us before we deal with it, it's not going to end up turning out the way that we want it to. Some of us first need to see the picture that God has of us before we can see the picture of someone else. And I just want to encourage you in that today. I want to encourage you in the fact that God doesn't see us where we're at. He sees us where he wants us. He sees us in the light that he created us for. And the process of of fixing us up, it's not always easy. Every single one of these shows, halfway through, there's some big disaster that happens, they run out of money, there's an unexpected issue that comes up. There are bumps in the road to becoming what God would have us become. And so it's a process. It's a process that we have to commit ourselves to. But I do believe that, that we have to be right with God before we can, we can, in any good conscience, reach out and try to fix some of these other relationships. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you don't see us for who we are right now. Father, I thank you 
for that because if, if you saw us the way that we are right now, God, it could, it could change anyone's perspective. Maybe not yours. In fact, it wouldn't change yours, but you choose not to view us in the state that we are in. Father, you have the ability to look beyond the sin, to look beyond the brokenness of our lives, to look beyond the walls that we've actively built up ourselves to see the purpose that you have given us. And Father, I pray that as we, as we conclude this service this morning, Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Father, that we would be open to the renovation that you want to do in our own lives to empower us to do the same in these relationships that they need more of you, God. Father, I pray that you would speak to the individual today who needs to be not only restored to you, but maybe, maybe there's those of us this morning who you're here today and you know where you stand with God. You, you, you're, you're, you're firmly planted in that relationship, but you also know that there's some relationships in your life that need some work. Maybe there's somebody in this room that you need to fix a relationship with someone else in this room. Father, I ask that today, not because of anything that is said or done, but because of your spirit, that healing would take place. Father, that restoration would take place, that, that relationships would be reconciled to what they once were, something that you gave us for our benefit, God. You knew that we needed to go through life together. Father, I pray that you would actively be at work in our hearts. Father, I thank you that the picture that we see of ourselves that might look like one of those fixer-uppers, God, that, that's not how it always has to stay. Father, I thank you that you have a goal to bring us back to the way that you created us, to bring out those, those purposes that you have given each and every one of us. Father, I thank you for what you want to do in each and every one of us here this morning. Thank you for watching the message today. If you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, or if you have questions about your personal walk with Jesus Christ, we'd love to help answer those questions. We've prepared something specifically for you. It's a five-day devotional called Walk by Faith. We'd love to give you this as our gift to you today. Please contact us using the information provided for you on the screen. May God bless you.